Amen. Amen. All right. I have turned the recorder on uh, for those who will uh, not be able to attend, but they can pick it up on YouTube uh, or they can pick it up on Facebook. All right. Praise God. We are in Revelations chapter 11. And y'all know this thing is only getting goodier and goodier. I mean, she heating up. She heating up. Okay. So uh, we're going to start with Revelations 11 starting in uh, verse 1. Uh, as always, I put the cross-reference scriptures at the bottom. The cross-reference scriptures are at the bottom, so if you need to take notes, uh, you can grab them. Uh, if I'm a little too quick on it, you can always um, pick it up when you go to YouTube and uh, look at it again. Uh, but yeah, all the cross-reference scriptures are at the bottom. So let's go ahead and kick this puppy off with verse 1. And uh, realizing everything that's already taken place, you know, it's it's been uh, really, I think for John, it's been really traumatic, you know. But then something odd happens in chapter 11. And so we're going to look at this because this is really, to me, it's kind of like out of place unless you know the backstory. So let's look at it. Uh, then there was given me, and this is John speaking, a measuring rod like a staff. And someone said, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar of incense and count those who worship in it. Now, that is really, I mean, if you think about it, that is really uh, an odd thing um, to pop up in scripture at this, at this juncture. You know, with all the stuff that's going on on the planet, I mean, God is tearing up some stuff on the planet. And all with the hopes of somebody repenting, you know. And as we see uh, right now, uh, nobody's trying to repent. I also put this in the Amplified Version so y'all can get the full effect of what's going on. The rod that he's using to measure with is actually a six-foot rod, or that's what we believe it to be. Uh, the Greek correspondence uh, to the Hebrew word meaning when he says uh, stand or arise, you know, uh, it can be an instruction to prepare to fulfill a command, uh, somewhat similar to a uh, military order that they used to give me back in the day when they would say, attention, you know, I had to pop to attention. And this is kind of what uh, some theologians believe is happening here uh, when it says, uh, you know, God is telling John, you know, uh, take this measurement, you know, uh, he's basically telling them to, you know, get in position. So the measuring uh, reed that's kind of like a rod is similar uh, to what we see in Ezekiel. Now, I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with this, but in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 40 through 43, uh, this is an extended passage where uh, the temple is measured in Ezekiel. So Ezekiel is seeing a millennial temple. And a lot of theologians believe this is the temple that is in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And so they see this temple uh, and this is an earthly temple uh, that Ezekiel is describing and measuring. Uh, uh, the temple in Revelation though seems to be actually before the temple of Ezekiel because we haven't gotten to the place of the millennial reign yet. That's the thousand year reign of Christ. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet and so this temple is actually before that temple. So they don't think it's it's the exact same temple. However, there are a few other Bible examples of measuring. Uh, in Zechariah chapter 2, a man is measuring Jerusalem, you know, and the scene that is evidently shows God coming judgment on the city. So you think about the measurement is tied to the judgment that God is about to bring on uh, New Jerusalem, well, on Jerusalem, uh, because they're rebuilding it. So now you got, um, he says, rise and measure the temple. Uh, sometimes in the Old Testament, the idea of measure communicates ownership, protection, and preservation. When Habakkuk was prophesying, he stood and measured the earth. Think about that. He measured planet Earth. That was Habakkuk uh, 3.6. And the idea was that the Lord owned the Earth and could do with it with whatever he pleased. 
when the, this temple is measured, it shows that God knows it's every dimension and he is in charge. He is com in complete and full control. Uh, and so uh, when, you, when you're measuring something, uh, he is showing uh, ownership, but he's also showing um, that he has complete authority over uh, what is being measured. God is in charge, y'all. This is one of the glorious, mighty themes of the book of Revelation, particularly in Revelations uh, 11, 17. Again, he uses the title, Almighty God. The Greek word for almighty is patokleti, and it describes the one who has his hands on everything. Nine out of 10 times the word is used in the New Testament. It is used in the book of Revelation. This temple will be the scene of a great horror and a great glory. But God is in charge, whether it's the horror or the glory, or whether it's the bad actions of one man, God is in control. And that's the one and most important thing that we want to remember. The other thing is it's called the temple of God. The identity of this temple uh, is an important matter for interpreters. Many see the temple as a symbol of the church. I thought this was interesting. Paul describes the church as a temple. We know this to be true. In Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 19 to 21, Paul describes the church like this. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having built on a foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And so Paul uses it uh, kind of as symbolic of um, the temple of God. Peter also describes the church as a temple in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, you also as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house, meaning temple. However, and this is a point I really want to make about this. Uh, even though some theologians uh, believe that this temple could symbolically be the church, I don't agree. And I'll show you why I don't agree with that. Uh, if the temple in Revelation 11 is symbolic reputation of the church, why does it have to be measured? And what is the significance of, you know, the courts and the altar? You know, if you're talking about this being being the church, you know, why would that be necessary? You know, um, if the church is the temple and who are the worshipers? If the church is the temple, who is the folks out there worshiping um, in, the, in this chapter? And there's too many specific details here uh, for this to match a generalized picture of the church as a temple of God. So there are illustrations, examples, analogies, um, where it is a good interpretation that the church is symbolic, but this is not one of them. Now, here's something else interesting. Uh, it is more likely that uh, this temple that uh, they're talking about is a earthly temple um, and the fulfillment of the prophecy that Daniel and Jesus and Paul was talking about when they talked about the abomination of desolation. The prophet Daniel told us the Antichrist will break his covenant with the Jewish people, bringing sacrifice and offerings to an end. The Antichrist will defile the temple by setting something abominable there. We see that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, chapter 11, verse 31, and chapter 12, verse 11. I'll go ahead and read a couple of those for you. In Daniel 9, 27, the NIV version, he says, He will confirm a covenant with many of the one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination and cause desolation until the end 
that is decreed uh, is poured out on him. And of course, in 1131, Daniel as well, his armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the day of sacrifice. Then they will set up an abomination that causes a desolation. The last one I read is in 1211. It says, from time, from the time of that daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Now, what is significant about that? The two, 1,290 days is um, three and a half years. And we know that the whole tribulation is seven years. And so we believe, and like a lot of theologians, they believe this is the latter half of tribulation because this is when things get crazy. This is when things turn up to the uttermost where God is literally bringing time to an end. He's bringing everything to a close. Uh, so this is the last three and a half years of planet Earth. Now, this is what the prophet Daniel said um, was going to happen in these last days, that um, the Antichrist was going to come and set up their um, abomination of desolation. Basically what that is, he sets in the temple uh, that's supposed to be a reconstructed temple for uh, the Jews or the Israelites, and they're going to try to reinstate animal sacrifices and things like that uh, because they don't believe the Messiah has come. And so uh, they're going to act like Jesus never came. So this is a strict set of Judaism uh, that is going to be do that, that's going to actually uh, make this happen. And so the devil is going to break faith with them because he's going to start out making pretend he's their friend. Matter of fact, he's going to try to deceive the whole planet to make them think that he's a kind and a benevolent and a peacemaker for the planet. Of course, we know Satan is a liar. We know Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And we know good and well that um, Satan uh, is sure to break his word and to break faith. So he makes um, friends with the Jews, helps them go ahead and um, accomplish their goal to re, uh, remake the temple and reinstate sacrifices only to turn around stop them from doing that and when he stops them from doing that he puts his own idol in the holy place so that they can you know stop sacrificing uh to to god and start honoring him and worshiping him so he literally puts a a, a image of himself in the holy of holies and so jesus uh, also talks about this just like Daniel did, Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16, and verse 21. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus said uh, to look for the abomination standing in the holy place, which would be the pivotal sign that the season of God's wrath was upon the earth. Paul backs it up in his letter, his second letter to the Thessalonians in chapter two, verses three to four. This is what Paul says. Paul told us that the Antichrist would sit in the temple of God. He literally said that in Thessalonians two, three to four. The concept of the abomination of desolation is often spiritualized, which explains um, idolatrous worship established in the heart of God's people. Um, and so they, they're looking at it all symbolically and it's all spiritual um, that this, this abomination of desolation is actually set up because since they believe that we are the temple, then they're believing that this thing is set up in the heart of God's people. Uh, and it's, a, it's really over spiritualized. Um, but here's what they think, you know, that, um, that that's what's happening. But in what sense can people of God, uh, if we're God's temple, worship the Antichrist and worship Satan? Ain't no way in the world the people of God are going to be worshiping the Antichrist and worship Satan. So I don't agree 
uh, with this these theologians who go along with spiritualizing this whole thing. I believe it is a real temple that is yet to be constructed. And I believe it's a real temple that's gonna be constructed by um, the Jews. And when I say Jews, uh, I use the term in the sense that it's actually the Israelites. You know, it's all, all the tribes and not just uh, the tribe of Judah. Um, even though they all go under the the uh, the title of Jew. So, point of fact, today there are Jewish people very interested in rebuilding the temple and resuming sacrifice and are making preparations to do that right now. Yeah, I found that in my studies. I was like, wow. So they're actually trying to go ahead and make this thing a reality. Today, you can visit the Temple Institute in the Jewish quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. There, a group of Jews absolutely dedicated to rebuilding the temple attempt to educate the public and raise awareness for the new temple. They are trying to replicate everything they can for the new temple, down to the specific pot and pans used in the sacrifices. This is happening right now. This is happening today. This is amazing. Israel is a nation again. Since 1948, they became a nation. And efforts to rebuild the temple are real. The main Jewish group leading the charge to rebuild the temple is an organization called Faith of the Temple Mount, who say they will continue their efforts to reestablish the Jewish temple on the mount one leader of the group said, we shall continue our struggle until Israel, Israeli flag is flying from the Dome of the Rock. In Israel, there are students being trained for the priesthood, learning how to conduct animal sacrifices in the rebuilt temple. Y'all, that's just plain amazing. You talk about folks that has not accepted the Messiah, uh, has not accepted the fact that he has come, uh, the savior of the world. This group has definitely made up their mind, this ain't it. But this is just the group. It's not all of the Jews that's doing this. And it's important to understand that most Jews and religious or secular Jews uh, don't care one bit about building the temple. So it's just a, a, a faction that is trying to make this happen. Uh, because they don't believe the Messiah has come. Uh, and so that's kind of how that thing is going. So now, interestingly enough, you know, Christians are getting excited when they see the efforts to rebuild the temple. And at the same time, we should understand that the basic impulse to rebuild this temple is not of God at all. Rebuilding the temple is not of God. And it's easy to understand why it's not of God. It's not of God because Jesus is our sacrifice. There's no more need for animal sacrifices. So there's no more need for a temple to serve that purpose so that they can sacrifice for the sins of the nation. There's no need for that. Jesus fulfilled everything that we needed as a Messiah, as a savior, as a God, as a creator, he did everything he needed to do. There's nothing else that needs to be done. And so uh, some Christians getting excited about it. If you get excited, it may be from the standpoint that it lines up with prophetic scripture and revelations and Daniel, you know, and Matthew and Thessalonians. So that might get you excited to know that they're actually trying to make happen what prophecy says is going to happen. Now, Orthodox Jews consider that the Messiah will rebuild the temple. However, the man they may initially embrace as their Messiah may in fact be the Antichrist. Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name and you have not received me. If another comes in my name, him you will receive. Jesus said this in John chapter 5 and verse 43. So, before we jump on the second verse, are there any questions or comments? Hey, Kevin. 
Yeah. You, this remind me of I saw this show on TV and it was talking about um the Israelites and um I forget the name of the other group. Oh my God. The Muslims? Yeah, no, not the Muslim. They had two different okay, the Israelites, they were talking about the temple. And they split it up so the I think so the Muslims can come in and worship and then the Israelites do they say all right? I know what you're talking about because the Muslims have set up um in a part of where the temple is supposed to have existed. The Muslims have set up a shrine. Yeah. Where, yeah. And so they consider that a holy place. It's called the Dome of the Rock, and they worship there. And it's right where, um, I guess you could say, the outer court would be. I and saw that on TV. I was so amazed. I couldn't get over it because I thought, this is part of the temple. We're we looking at it right now. That's what I couldn't get over, and it was in the Bible. Yeah, 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 that's true. Get out of here. Okay. Hey, hey, Pastor. Go for it, bro. Hey, I thought it was really, uh, really unique how you were uh, just sharing about the temple worship and how that is, you know, Christ has fulfilled what was in the Old Testament. And so they used to sacrifice like lambs and whatnot. And so the uniqueness and the connection there is like Christ is the Lamb of God so that that we no longer need that you know we don't we're not under that circumcision christ is the anointed one that has partook and like took that away so now he fulfills that as well so i just thought that was really cool that you said that it just reminded me of that absolutely absolutely there's nothing else we need to do jesus literally fulfilled all of the law and all the requirements something that uh, no one else could do. And that's why uh, he actually tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can even make it to the Father except uh, through him. And if he's saying, if I'm the only way to the Father, um, he's actually letting y'all know, you know, there's letting them know at that time that there's going to be uh, no place for sacrifices in the future because he is the sacrifice. So powerful, powerful. So uh, here's the interesting thing. We get a little deeper. In verse 2, it says, uh, and so God is, um, it could be God, it could be an angel, but he is hearing a voice from heaven giving him instructions on what to measure. And the voice is saying, but leave out the court of the Gentiles, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles the nation, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months, which is three and a half years. It lines up perfectly with what the prophet Daniel was saying. Uh, that's just phenomenal when you think about that. You can go ahead and take note of the cross reference scriptures at the bottom too for Daniel, Revelations, and Matthew, which is where Jesus is actually uh, talking about it. Praise God. And so he says, but leave out the court, which is outside the temple. The outer court needs not be measured uh, because it has been given to the Gentiles. Perhaps this is because the outer court of this rebuilt temple includes the Islamic Dome of the Rock Shrine, which currently stands on the Temple Mount and is a point of great contention between the Jews and the Muslims. When the Romans uh, conquered Jerusalem in AD 70, they destroyed the city so completely that the foundation of the old temples are not easily found. Most have long assumed that the Dome of the Rock Shrine stands on the place of the old temple. But new research gives some evidence that the temple may have stood to the north 
where the Dome of the Rock swine shrine is today. And that if the temple were to be rebuilt at all, it would be uh, in its old place. The Dome of the Rock shrine would be in the outer court. If this is the case, the research is by no means settled, uh, then it would explain why the angel told John, leave out the court, which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the Gentiles. Now that's, that's phenomenal. Uh, there's some more information on the Dome of the Rock um, uh, as far as historically speaking. Um, if you want to get into that, uh, I can send you a link that will provide you all of that wonderful information. Okay? All right. Okay, let's continue on. And they will tread the holy city underfoot. They will tread the holy city underfoot. The holy city, Jerusalem, will be tread underfoot for a period of 42 months, which equals the 1260 um, days or three and a half years that Daniel was talking about. This trampling of Jerusalem by the Gentiles probably takes place in the last half of the final seven year period described by Daniel in Daniel chapter 11. Um, and when the Antichrist pours out his fury on the people of Israel as described in Revelation chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 24. And they will tread the holy city underfoot. Greek scholars A.T. Robinson said that a tread underfoot means to trample with contempt. To trample with contempt. That's like disrespecting not, not just the temple, but disrespecting uh God uh in every in every way. So that's <laughs> that's just powerful. All right. And you know y'all can stop me at any time if you have a question, so moving on. Man, we getting ready to jump on them two witnesses. Now, this part here, uh, man, I'm going to tell you something. This is like either a good novel. I know they've made movies and everything about these two witnesses. And there's been a lot of discussion about who these witnesses are. Um, but these witnesses are awesome. I'm telling you, they are just straight awesome. So let's go ahead and jump into the text. And it reads like this, and it is the Amplified Version. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, 42 months, three and one half years, dressed in sackcloth. These witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands which stand before the Lord of the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and devours the enemy. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These two witnesses have the power from God to shut up the sky so that it does not rain, uh, so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophecy regarding the judgment and salvation. And they have the power over waters, seas and rivers to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. Wow. I'm telling y'all, this is just, this is just incredible. This is just incredible. So let's take it a, take it a verse at a time. You know, first of all, he says, my two witnesses, this introduces uh, the two uh, of the more interesting characters of Revelation. These guys here, um, are identified uh, God takes ownership for them. They are my witnesses. You know, when I read that, I'll be honest with you, I was feeling some kind of way about it because I would love for the Lord to refer to us, his people, as his witnesses, as what we're supposed to be, you know? We are the witnesses, and I ain't talking about Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> I'm talking about witnesses of Jesus Christ uh, and, and his ambassadors. You know, we are his witnesses, and uh, that would be awesome. 
you know, if he identified us like that. But he, he doesn't give their name, but what he does give is a description of who these guys are and what these guys are capable of doing. And um, that's just phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Um, to know that they will prophesy <laughs> for three and a half years and they're going to do it in sackcloth and ashes, which is a time of mourning for the Jewish people. They do that when they're mourning and grieving. And uh, he's going to give them power. They're his witnesses and he gives them power to fulfill their mission and their call. He, he supplies them with everything that they need to be successful. Man, if that isn't a message for us all, to know that when you are witness for God, when you are servant of the Most High God, you can count on Him to provide you with the power, with the inspiration, with the skill set, with everything that you need to accomplish everything that God has called you to do. Praise God for that. So let's take a look at uh, verse 3, taking a little slower. Um, and it reads like this. Well, actually, no, let's jump into this thing. Um, I thought this was interesting. This is another theologian's comments. Um, uh, Walvoord is this theologian's name. He says, the two witnesses indeed serve with power, such power, in fact, that they are able to witness for uh, three and a half years in spite of an antagonistic world. And I'm going to add this, in spite of an antagonistic uh, antichrist, Satan, and kingdom of darkness that is also in operation in the last half of the seven-year tribulation. These boys witness with power and authority and boldness and carriage, and they aren't dissuaded. I mean, they give it, give it to a man, and I'm like, wow. They are described as uh, two olive trees and two lampstands. Now, that's that may be hard for you to visualize, so I'm going to try to help you out a little bit with that one. Uh, because this is how he was uh, identified uh, in Zechariah. Did I put that in there? I didn't. I'm sorry. I thought I'd put it in there. I didn't. All right. I didn't put it in there. I must have put it in the, in the other one I was working on. But anyway, uh, these two olive trees and lampstands uh, the witnesses have the unique and continual empowering from the Holy Spirit as shown in uh, Zechariah's olive tree with the oil lamp picture in Zechariah uh, chapter 4. Um, actually, I preached on that um, last Sunday. Uh, in Zechariah, well, Sunday before that, in Zechariah, you get this vision of olive trees. And normally, you know, they go through the process of getting the uh, oil out of the tree, processing it, purifying it, so that they can go ahead and uh, put it in the lamps because they want the lamps that's in the temple um, to continually burn and to burn fresh. So they're constantly caring for it and everything like that. A lot of preparation that's involved uh, with the temple keepers. But here's the thing. I want y'all to get this illusion, man. This is awesome. The, the, the lamp, I mean, the trees have a pipe. The pipe feeds into the lamp. And so you got oil coming from the source directly into uh, the lamps so that they continue to burn and burn brightly. And so now we see the same illusion in revelations of these two witnesses that are literally called um, uh, the, the, these witnesses. They are called the olive trees and the uh, two lamps. And so you see that there's the infusion and the power of the Holy Spirit that is sustaining these guys while they prophesy, while they bear witness of God Almighty. I mean, that's just, y'all know that's just awesome. That's just awesome. So in the passage from Zechariah, uh, has the first application of two men in Zechariah's day. So this is the first application. Joshua and Zerubbabel in that time. And of course, you know that the Israelites were returning um, uh, after being captured by the Babylonian Empire 
Um, and then, of course, Babylon was defeated by Persia. And Persia was the ones that released the Israelites back. And these guys were released literally to go back and rebuild uh, the temple. And so uh, we see that Joshua and Zerubbabel were key. Zerubbabel was really the governor. And they were key at rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the wall. Uh, that's Nehemiah's wall that we're talking about. Uh, just as these two witnesses were raised up as lampstands and witnesses for God and were empowered by the olive oil representing the power of the Holy Spirit, so the two witnesses in Revelation will likewise execute their prophetic office. That's just wow. In the picture from Zechariah's oil lamp uh, were filled directly from the olive trees with the pipes oils right into the lamp. Praise God. The continual and abundant flow, hallelujah, uh, into uh, those prophets of God. Man, this is just awesome. And if anyone would harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemy. You know, this. Uh, these two witnesses got this amazing ability to toast people uh, just like a dragon. They have special protection from God, similar to that of Elijah. In uh, 2 Kings, if you're familiar with the passage, uh, Elijah did the same thing. If you remember the story, uh, the king had sent, and it was an evil king, had sent uh, a platoon of 50 soldiers, excuse me, a captain of 50 soldiers to go and capture Elijah. And uh, when the captain and the 50 soldiers found Elijah, they ordered him to come down uh, off the mound uh, because the king wanted him. And Elijah said, if I am uh, the man of God, may the fire come down from heaven and consume you. And guess what? He was the man of God. So the fire came down from heaven and killed all those men. Word got back to the king and the king sent another captain with another 50 soldiers to get Elijah off that mound. And guess what happened to them? Same thing. They literally addressed him as man of God. He said, well, if I'm a man of God, let the fire consume you. And that's what? They were consumed. The third time the word got back to the king, he sent uh, a platoon of soldiers, another 50, another captain. But this dude came correct. This is how you pose approach the man of God with reverence for who that man of God serves you know, with respect for whom that man of God serves. So this dude comes up there, he falls on his knees, and he he begs, he begs Elijah to respect his life and the life of his men. You know, he know that he admits the king wants to see him, but he said, he literally even included himself, he says, but I, your servant, ask you to respect our lives, you know, because we know what happened to the other platoons. And of course, at that time, Elijah does go. But Elijah himself is destroying people with fire. And that's what they take note in the book of Revelation. You know, and these have power to shut up heaven. They have power over water to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with all plagues and often, um, and they desire now so as often as they want to. I mean, that sounds familiar to somebody, I'm sure. Because, you know, that's exactly what Moses did. Moses uh, did all of that. So the two witnesses have the power to bring both drought and plague similar uh, to the prophet Elijah, James. You can find that in James chapter 5. And then Moses in Exodus uh, chapter 7 to chapter 12. It says, they, these, and them. In the ancient Greek grammar, all the nouns used to speak of the two witnesses in the passage are in the masculine gender. The two witnesses are definitely two men. So, even though they don't tell us exactly who these witnesses are, we got a pretty good clue of who they are. Now, there are some other theories out there, and we may address a few of those uh, before our time is up, but then again, maybe not. I wanted y'all to see them boys breathing fire, so I did put that up there. All right, let's see if we can get through uh, chapter 11, verses 7. 
22, verse 10. When they had finished their testimony and given their evidence, the beast that comes up out of the abyss or the bottomless pit will wage war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie exposed in the open street of the great city Jerusalem, which is in the spiritual sense is called by a symbolic and allegorical name of Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Those from the people and tribes and language and nations looked at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not allow their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those non-believers who live on the earth will gloat over them and rejoice that they will send, this how much they'll, they'll rejoice, they will send gifts in celebration to one another because these two prophets tormented and troubled those who live on the earth. Wow. Wow. Y'all know that's just straight, that's just straight amazing. That's straight amazing. So let's dig a little deeper. Let's dig a little, deep, a little deeper. Now these prophets, fire-breathing prophets, glory to God, they make war. Now think about it. They make war against the, 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 the beast, makes war against them, overcomes them, and kills them. So the two witnesses are killed by the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. Now the beast was first introduced in Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. And who do you think this beast is likely uh, to be? I can give you one big clue. Uh, I think it's Satan himself. Um, and, and so, but their ministry is not cut short. I do want to make sure that y'all understand that. Uh, he didn't stop them from accomplishing what God had called them to do. Their ministry was not cut short. They fully uh, completed the task um, when they had, it literally says when they finished their testimony. So when they finished their testimony, that's when uh, the battle was raging between them and um, the beast. And we see the beast prevailed and actually killed them. So uh, Revelation 9 and Revelation 9, it says, uh, John sometimes uses the present tense uh, to refer vivid vividly to the future. Uh, John is in this place that's outside of time and space. And what John is seeing in these visions is fluid. And so some of his terminology gives you the impression that it's happening right then and there when it actually hasn't happened yet. John is seeing past, present, and future all at the same time. And so, I mean, God exists in this place, you know. Uh, but John, you know, he isn't accustomed to that. So he's giving it like he sees it. Praise God. Uh, God be thanked. We cannot be taken off uh, of this earth until we finish our testimony. See, that's the word there. That's what blessed me about the fact that uh, the devil with all his might and then the last three and a half years when he is literally in his glory, he will be no stronger than that moment in um, earth's history. And even at his strongest, he is not able to prevent those witnesses from completing um, their mission. And so that leads me to believe he can't uh, prevent us from completing our mission. That we can accomplish what God has called us to do if we submit and obey his word. And we follow him, uh, we'll be able to finish the race. And I praise God for that, that little bit right there. The devil does not have power over our lives. And I hope you all realize that. He has no power over you that you don't give him. I put a pin in that. He has no power over you except what you give him. And I know he's a liar. I know he's deceitful. I know he's got that amazing tongue that can almost convince anybody of anything. Uh, but don't let him don't let him rob you uh, of your, your, your foundation in Christ. You got to know that you know that you know who you are in Christ Jesus. Who you are and whose you are, you know, which means you got to know the word for yourself. You can't let a devil step up, knock on your door 
You open up the door and he gonna tell you about your Jesus. He gonna tell you about your Savior. He gonna tell you about your Bible. He gonna tell you about your Christianity. Cause the devil will walk up to your door and try to convince you of all kinds of heresies and lies and deceit just to trip you up. You know, yes, I do believe he comes to steal, to kill and to destroy, but he can't do nothing. He ain't got no power over you that you don't give him, praise God. And I, I know that to be true because that's what his word is saying to us. The passage illustrates the difference between being a witness and giving a testimony. A witness is not something we do, it's something we are. Giving testimony is what a witness does. That's what we do. If we are witnesses for Jesus Christ, we supposed to be giving our testimony. We supposed to be telling somebody about Jesus. And we'll be telling about him, not from a fictitious sign, sci-fi position, but we tell it to him because of our relationship, our personal relationship with Christ. Christ saved me. Christ delivered me. Christ healed me. Christ made me whole. Christ completed something in me. Christ positioned me. Christ promoted me. I ain't talking about uh, something I read about. I'm talking about something I know about. And see, people need to understand that your testimony, and you know, it's funny. People will try to tear down God. They'll try to tear down Jesus. They will try to tear down the word. But it's hard to tear down your testimony. How are they going to tear down your witness of what Christ did in your life? Can't do it. Convince you that Christ didn't, didn't save you? Convince you that Christ didn't heal your body? Give you clearness of, of thought and mind? Shoot. We give God the glory. Uh, we give God the praise uh, because he has done it all. And so, yes, yes, um, uh, we are witnesses. Glory to God. And it ain't something that we do. It's something who, that, that tells people who we are. And our, given our testimony, that's just what we do. And then it says that their dead bodies will lie in the street uh, of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, <laughs> where also the Lord was crucified. The two witnesses are killed in the city of Jerusalem, which is described in three illustrative terms. Check this out. They use the term of Sodom. Y'all know Sodom was jacked up. You go back to Genesis and read about Sodom and Gomorrah. God burned them cities down to nothing but sulfur and salt. Burned them down to almost ain't nothing to find archaeologically. That's how evil those cities were. And he's saying this city here spiritually is like Sodom, speaking of their immorality. They're like Egypt, speaking of uh, the oppression and the slavery and the idolatry uh, that they had going on. As the great city, a term often applied to Babylon, is the headquarters of the Antichrist. In Revelation 16, 19, 17, 18, 18, 10, 18, 16, 18, 18, 18, 18 19, and 18, 21. Now, I know I ran that off to you quick, but I have put that on the slide. So you can go back and you can literally write down every one of those scriptures when you go back and look at the slide because I, I make sure you get the cross-reference scriptures. Praise God. If during the first three and a half years of Jerusalem's uh, leadership uh, is in league with Antichrist, think about this. It's seven-year period, seven-year tribulation. And if in the first half... They are in league with the Antichrist. Lord, have mercy. It is easy to see how this title applies. It's easy. Any city in love with the Antichrist and enters into a covenant with him could easily be called Sodom, Sodom, Gomorrah, Egypt, Babylon. I mean, it could be called all of those things. Um, the title makes sense. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them making merry and sending gifts 
to one another. I mean, think about this. We're talking about the whole planet. This is amazing. I mean, you're talking about the strongest witness that will ever be for God and Jesus Christ and repentance and salvation. That will be the mightiest prayer. I'm talking about straight up witnessing for three and a half years, prophesying and witnessing where there's no doubt in their minds these are the men of God. These are the prophets of the Lord. And yet and still, when they are killed by the beast, the world rejoices like it's Christmas. The earth saw and rejoiced over the death of the two witnesses. You know, this fact uh, that this is seen by all the people, tribes, tongues, and nations is probably um, due to the mass and jump in our technology, you know, like the multimedia. We can see stuff that's happening all over this planet at any time. You let something jump off and the news is going to have it on there. I don't care where it is on this planet. You're going to be able to see it on your television. And you, you don't even have to have cable, vials. I mean, you don't even have to have television. They can show it on the internet. You could go to your computer and see what's happening around the world. Just type in news. It will show you everything. And so it is no doubt in my mind that this capability already exists for, for something like this. So if these two prophets show up and start showing out for God, oh, it's going to be headline news. It's going to be CNN. It's going to be Fox. It's going to be everybody. Everybody. International News, BBC. Everybody's going to be telling you about these two prophets. You're going to hear their message. You're going to hear their witness. I mean, how awesome is that? It's going to be beyond. It's going to be beyond the shadow of a doubt. It says people, tribes, tongues, and nations. Everybody, people are going to be able to see it on their cell phones, their tablets, their laptops. They're going to be able to see it on everything, and they're going to be watching because these boys are going to be off the chain. It is amazing and not far fetched at all. And talk about worldwide broadcast news. Glory to God. You know, also, the idea is also that uh, the world treats these two witnesses in a humiliating manner. I mean, who does that? To have their dead bodies lying in full view um, is the worst humiliation a person can suffer. Don't even put them in a grave, don't even put them in a tomb. Just let them lie out there like you're going to let them rot. Like that's your, your your great act of defiance. You know, like, yeah, they, we can mock them now. We can make fun of them now. We can pass gifts and we can praise the name of this new uh, person that they seem to be idolizing and worship worshiping. I mean, to think that they're making merry and sending gifts to one another, celebrating the death of two godly men, that just shows you how evil those days and those times will be. It can't get no evil. I mean, that's just straight up evil. All right, I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna say this, and then we're gonna have to give it a few minutes. I just saw my time is running out because these two prophets tormented uh, those who dwell on the earth. The preaching of these two witnesses and their call to repentance was a torment for many because they could not stand to hear the truth while they love their lie. They couldn't stand to hear the truth while they were loving living that lie. They were loving it. And here they are getting hit with the truth. Didn't have sense enough to know time was up. Didn't have sense enough to know it was the end. The prophet out there telling them, it'd be just like Noah building an ark all the time it took him to build that ark. Them people sit out there making fun of him because he built an ark and they ain't never seen no rain. And they ain't never seen no rain. He built it on dry land. They call him cuckoo. They making fun of him. And you know, he letting them know why he built an ark. They ain't paying him no mind. I have to say, you know, his family having faith in him is awesome because they believed him. And his family went with him. You know, that's just, that's powerful. When you think about that, that's just straight up powerful to know your family stands with you in faith. 
That's awesome. But the people didn't. Even till when the door was closing, they, I mean, until, you know, they might have, somebody might have had a thought when they heard that crack of thunder. Somebody might have had a thought when that first drop fell. Hmm, what this? What's happening? Could he have been telling the truth? I'm telling you. You know, it ain't no time uh, to try to get right. You know, it's a time to be right. You know, if you a child of God and you're in the church, uh, you need to be serving God uh, with everything he's blessed you with. I mean, he blessed you with health, strength, life. He blessed you with everything that you need that pertains to life and godliness. And we need to be serving him with it all. So uh, I will, uh, if y'all have any questions, we can fill the questions. Uh, if you don't have any questions or comments, um, I can uh, let Angel uh, pray. I do want to thank uh, Pastor Russell and Pastor Thompson for zooming in with us. Uh, they're going to be zooming in every now and then uh, to uh, join in with our Bible study. I praise God for those men of God. Uh, there's two of them, just like them two witnesses. Praise God. <laughs> I don't know if they breathe in fire, uh, but <laughs> I know they can preach it hot. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know. But I praise God for the brothers. Amen. Thank you for having us, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Man, it done got quiet. I guess. Uh... Hey, 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 Kevin. Kevin. Oh, okay. There we go. Hey, Kevin. Yes, ma'am. I'm all the way back. I'm still, I'm just 